Uh, my name is Rob Penzer. I'm the Associate Director of the Helix Center. I just have a few announcements. Next Saturday, March 7th, we have Curiosity in conjunction with the publication of the eponymous book by Alberto Manguel uh, with psychiatrist Paul Browd, physicist Edgar Chueri, poet Marie Howe, writers Siri Hustved, and of course Alberto Manguel himself. On April 18th, we have a uh, John Templeton Foundation Roundtable, The Mind of a Child, followed by April 25th, another Templeton Foundation Roundtable, The Changing Nature of Free Will. On May 2nd, we'll be discussing trauma and its after effects. On May 9th, we'll have a program of experimental films. And uh, make note that uh, there is a Helix Center benefit coming up on May 8th at the Lotus Club. And, uh, Announcements will be uh, forthcoming, uh, so watch your emails, and please uh, check on our website, helixcenter.org. Please like us on Facebook, and, and like us anyway, and uh, follow us on Twitter. And now uh, to today's program. And please, yes, thanks, Ed. Please make sure that uh, if you did receive uh, one of the evaluations for today's program, that you uh, fill it out and hand it back to uh, someone from the Helix Center. We, uh, we depend on your feedback greatly uh, for the fulfillment of our uh, Templeton grant. So I'm going to introduce uh, today's participants. And as I say your name, if you could just raise your hand so the audience will identify you. David Chalmers. Professor of Philosophy and co-director of the Center for Mind, Brain, and Consciousness at New York University, is best known for his work on consciousness, especially for his formulation of the hard problem of consciousness and his arguments against materialism. His 1996 book, The Conscious Mind in Search of a Fundamental Theory, was successful with both popular and academic audiences. He's been a leader in the interdisciplinary science of consciousness and also works on issues about language, metaphysics, and artificial intelligence. His most recent book, Constructing the World, was published in 2012 and attempts to build a model of the world from a few primitive concepts. Carl Friston, professor at the Institute of Neurology, University College London, is a theoretical neuroscientist and authority on brain imaging. The inventor of a major body of statistical techniques for analyzing functional neuroimaging and other mathematical contributions, he currently works on models of functional integration in the human brain and the principles that underlie neuronal, <coughs> excuse me, neuronal interactions with his main contribution to theoretical neurobiology being the free energy principle for action and perception. Among his awards and honors, he has been the recipient of the first Young Investigators Award in Human Brain Mapping, a as Fellow of the Royal Society, and recipient of the Weldon Memorial Prize and Medal in 2013 for contributions to mathematical biology. Pete Hutt has been Professor of Astrophysics at the Institute for Advanced Studies since 1985, where he is currently the head of the Program for Interdisciplinary Studies. His research and interests encompass computational astrophysics, interdisciplinary explorations of cognitive science and philosophy of science, the origins of life on Earth as well as elsewhere in the universe, for which he is a foreign principal investigator at the Earth Life Institute, Science Institute at the Tokyo Institute of Technology. The author of more than 200 publications, he was honored in 2004 when a main belt asteroid was named 17031 Piet Hutt by the International Astronomical Union's Committee on Small Body Nomenclature. Gabriel Bennett Jackson is Assistant Professor of Philosophy at Stony Brook University. After receiving her PhD in philosophy from Harvard in 2011, she was the Andrew Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow at the University of Toronto's Jackman Humanities Institute and a visitor at the Institute for Advanced Study at their School of Social Sciences. She's interested in scientifically informed approaches to the study of the mind, and her recent work includes articles, Skillful Action in Peripersonal Space, and Neurophilosophy and Its Discontents. Ken Paller, Professor of Psychology and Director of the Training Program in the Neuroscience of Human Cognition at Northwestern University, is a cognitive neuroscientist whose recent research includes sleep's role in memory and memory dysfunction, sensory processing during sleep and learning, the neural substrates of conscious memory experiences, and memory and intuition. A fellow of both the Mind and Life Institute and the Association for Psychological Science and journal editor at Neuropsychologia, he is the recipient of multiple research grants, including the NSF and NIH, and the Senator Mark Hatfield Award from the Alzheimer's Association. Nicholas Schiff is Gerald Katz Professor of Neurology and Neuroscience, as well as Director of the Laboratory for Cognitive 
neuromodulation at Weill Cornell Medical College. His re research focuses on recovery of consciousness following brain injuries. He and his research group have contributed several landmark advances, including the first demonstrations of brain structural alterations occurring in the setting of very late recovery from severe brain injury. He received the 2007 Research Award for Innovation in Neuroscience from the Society for Neuroscience for his research on arousal regulation of deep brain electrical stimulation, demonstrating that long-lasting severe cognitive disability may be influenced by electrical stimulation of the human central thalamus. And now, to our roundtable. Uh, I thought I'd get you started by uh, saying that uh, two weeks ago, we showed the movie Particle Fever here, and the documentary. And then we had a roundtable afterwards. And as you know, that was about de detecting the Higgs boson. So my question to you is, if we can detect Higgs boson, why are we having so much trouble with consciousness? Sure. Um, I guess there's a lot of things that make consciousness distinctive and difficult. Um, science is supposed to be objective, but consciousness is this quintessentially subjective phenomenon. It's defined as subjective experience, the subjective experience of the mind and of the world. And, but we want to explain everything in terms of objective mechanisms. That's what we do in science. And there seems to be this potential gap in the explanation between the level of objective mechanisms, how one thing causes another thing, and this billiard ball causation in the universe, and consciousness. How is it that this giant network of neurons we have in the head objectively hooked up bring about consciousness? Now, this doesn't mean you can't do science on it. One of the wonderful things that's happened in the last you know, uh, 20 odd years now is there's been an exploding science of consciousness. The neuroscientists have been, have been uh, studying it, making all kinds of progress on finding the, you know, the bits of the brain that go along with, with bits of consciousness. But it is, for now, a science of correlation. We know that some bits of the brain go along with some bits of consciousness. We're still working on the part which is about explanation. And I think you know, it's these issues about explanation that really make the study of consciousness difficult. I'll take a stab at following that up. I think the, the evolution and the maturity of theory in physical science is just so vastly beyond what it is in biological science to give you an idea of what consciousness, what the rules of the game might be for causal um, creation of consciousness in a, in, a, in a central nervous system. And the measurements that we have that we can link correlationally are few and far between, so that we're, we're, just, we're just very far behind the curve of anything like what, what got you to a Higgs boson, a theory predicting a particular phenomena in the physical structure of the brain that's linked to consciousness. I mean, it's very hard, actually, to know if somebody can't show you any response, whether they're conscious. That's a, a large operational part of what we do at the interface of clinical medicine and, and research to try to understand retained consciousness in a structurally injured brain because we don't have rules that say, okay, you know, if you have these parts of the brain in there in these states, you definitely have consciousness. Another problem with um, trying to explain consciousness is, is that um, sort of like other phenomena in science, uh, when you observe them, you don't uh, necessarily expect them to change fundamentally upon observation, but the nature of consciousness is that the observer in the observed are the same thing. What it is to have a conscious mind is to be an observer and to have a point of view. And so, um, I mean, the physicists are familiar with this uh, phenomenon. I mean, you know, if you're looking at a conscious state or a conscious process, uh, in virtue of looking at it, have you artificially uh, changed the, thing, the very thing you're supposed to be explaining? And so how do you get behind uh, being the observer and focus on the, on the real phenomenon as it's happening? So I'd, I'd also agree with these reasons for why this is a difficult problem to try to understand consciousness. But I think it's nice that David came up with this uh, catchphrase of the hard problem of consciousness, because note that he didn't decide to talk about the impossible problem of consciousness. <laughs> he, he didn't say it was that difficult as to be impossible. There is a science of consciousness, and that's moving forward, as he mentioned, um, and will continue to move forward. So we 
we admit to it being a difficult problem, but I'm not sure if we think it's impossible. That's the spirit. Yeah. Well, I was just going to follow up on the, the observer aspect. I mean, part, it may be that that aspect of the problem is the thing that makes it hard. I think that's, that, you know, that's the interesting question. Why is it so hard? If you follow Richard Feynman, that if I want to understand something, I have to be able to model it. What you're asking of an understanding of consciousness is the ability to model myself. And I think there's something fundamentally impossible about a system that can model itself because it has to represent itself. And as soon as it does that, it has to represent that representation and that infinitum. So there may be something deeply problematic and deeply hard about the brain modeling itself, which is not an aspect of modeling the Higgs boson. It's very interesting for me to hear your example of the Higgs boson. <laughs> Since uh, about 40 years ago, I started my graduate studies. Uh, studies. It's hard to imagine, 40 years. But <laughs> and what I did was to compute, to make computations of the Higgs boson. And uh, I, I had many different interests. It was hard to, uh, to choose. So I tried to do a double PhD in particle physics and in astronomy, the very largest and the very smallest, because they are the simplest. This scale is the most difficult to understand. And uh, by the time I got my PhD, I got a feeling that it might take a while for the Higgs boson to be discovered. So I decided to become an astrophysicist rather than a Higgs boson specialist. And I'm glad I did, because most of my career I would have to tw twiddle my thumbs. But, uh, what you said about uh, physics uh, so being so different from, uh, uh, from other uh, from brain studies, uh, I think there are three big problems in all of science, the three biggest problems. Where does matter come from? Where does life come from? And where does consciousness come from? And uh, the where is really a why question. Why is there matter? Why is there uh, life? Why is there consciousness? If you would have nothing at all, you would never expect that to be something. Forget about who is asking the questions, but in, in, in principle. So big surprise, there is something at all. And then if you have physics and chemistry, who would have guessed a living cell? So complicated, big surprise. And giving simple life, who, who would have guessed consciousness? So the three questions can also be formulated. Uh, why is there matter? Why is there life? Why is there the ability to ask why is there is matter, why is there life, and why is there is consciousness? And that is that's uh, feedback loop. But Dave, you think there are some hard problems that can't be solved. So you think there is an impossible problem of consciousness? Oh, I think we have a I think we have a scientific theory of consciousness, and I've been very invested in the uh, the movement to work towards such a science. But I think some theories will be good theories and some theories will be, uh, will be bad theories. Mm -hmm. So for example, some people out there would like to just reduce consciousness to a process in the brain and say all there is to consciousness is you know, some neurophysiological process and we can give a complete explanation of consciousness in terms of a bunch of uh, neural firings mm -hmm. in the brain. For various reasons, I think that kind of theory, although you know, it's, it's a great thing to aim for, but I think that kind of theory isn't going to work. Any explanation that's wholly in terms of the neurophysiology of the brain is basically going to explain a bunch of the, uh, maybe a bunch of the things we do, you know, our ability to get around in the world and to respond and so on, but it's always going to leave out the subjective experience. So I've argued that we need a different kind of theory, one that takes consciousness as, as uh, something fundamental in the world and connects it all of these other things, but you know, that's, I would still see that as a solution to the hard problem. And the hard problem is explaining how is it that consciousness arises from the processes in the brain. It's just I think you need, you know, you need a, the standard methods we've developed so far in neuroscience only go so far, and I think a lot of people agree we need new methods. The question is, what are those new methods and new theories? What are those new methods? Why do you need, what, 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 why would you need new theories? Why, why not just figure out the way? I mean, you know what, co what brings about consciousness, don't you? Uh, you said firing of um, millions or billions of neurons. So you know what brings it about. Coffee. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yes. Yeah. But how does coffee bring about consciousness? That's what we need to know. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I don't think that we do know that. I think what we have are very good understandings of state correlations and of, of, of brain state and likelihood of consciousness. And that's, you know, that's better than nothing. And it, and it gives us a clue about what aspects of neuronal function are more or less important to wakeful consciousness, for example. And that's, I think, probably where our, our best correlational data are right now. But, but it's actually, it's not good enough for you to just get the brain data and to make a reasonable or fiducial inference about whether somebody actually is conscious. Um, you can make a pretty good risk assessment, I think, and an increasingly good risk assessment, and that's, um, that's different. If you wanted to just partition the problem, right? if there was a problem of how does consciousness arise from neuronal processes, that presumably is easier than the reverse question is how does consciousness Affect or influence or nuance neural processing. Absolutely. So you, you are, I mean, your job in terms of detecting conscious level, I think, right. is a testament to the fact there's an enormous amount of progress made in mapping from the biophysics to the conscious level. And I thought the deeper problem is getting back again. But I think, you know, quite frankly, it's a very uh, sort of humbling job, right? Because you're, you're often la la left with a very wide variance of uncertainty. And, that, that, and, and um, as you say, I mean, I, once you get to the idea that consciousness might have some emergent effects, like you know, on top, a, a dynamic element that on top of the brain then has causal effect on the structure. Well, I just, we don't have a model that gets us even close to those sorts of questions yet. Um, so, I mean, from my point of view, but that's, you know, maybe a limited, you know, understanding. But do you, do you see that margin of uncertainty? decreasing Absolutely. through the years. Yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think we're making a lot of progress. It's just that we're not anywhere near a standard model which would produce something like a, a prediction about something from theory that we might then go, mo go measure in the brain and say, aha, this model is right. And that's, the, that's sort of the amazing thing about the Higgs boson, yes. I think. Is that we got but, but Dave is making the assumption that no physiological theory will ever be sufficient. He prefers a theory with consciousness as a primitive which is a fine alternative for theory, but your assumption that a neurophysiological theory is going to come up short is really based on our current understanding of consciousness. And you're projecting about future theories of consciousness that haven't been presented yet. So how do we, well, one why, thing why, why should the rest of us, I don't know if the rest of us are convinced, but why should the rest uh -huh. of us be convinced that none of those future theories are going to provide what you say you don't think is possible? Um, well, I think it depends. I mean, different people are going to get off the bus at different points. First of all, it's to make a point about current theories. I mean, is what current theories gives us basically of a level of correlation. I think what we are getting is this connection from this mapping, I think as Carl was putting it, from neural processes to, uh, to consciousness. And it's slow and Slow, slow progress, two steps forward and one step back. But we're make, getting somewhere in the mapping. But it's still of a level of you know, mappings or correlations. There's nothing analogous, say, to what you got. Um, Pete mentioned the case of life. So let's take one central element to the explanation of life, the explanation of the genetic processes in terms of, of DNA. What uh, Watson and Crick didn't do was, ah, we discovered that whenever there's life, there's, there's DNA. Look at this amazing correlation. Rather, they found, a, uh, they found a mechanism, a potential mechanism, at least, in the structure of the, the DNA molecule. And they told you know, the beginnings of a potential story about how this could explain the things that we want the gene to, uh, to explain, like the transmission of characteristics from one generation to the next. We just have nothing like that kind of story right now in the neuroscience of consciousness. Um, even though we've got, we're developing some nice correlations. And then the question is, why is that? Is it, just, is it just something about the structure of our current theories? Or is it something about the character of what you get from these um, neurobiological explanations? I think the more you look at it, the more it starts to look as if it's not just something about the contingent character of the neurobiological theories we've come up with so far. It's rather something about their mechanistic nature. It's all about, you know, um, you've got a bunch of uh, objective mechanisms which are here performing certain functions, doing certain things. But you can always raise the, raise the further question, why does all that give you subjective experience? Why should it be 
Why should it feel like something from the inside? So either, it looks like either what you've got to do is add some ingredient to that explanation to, have, to you know, put some extra thing in the base, or the alternative, and it's a, and it's a important alternative is to somehow deflate the phenomenon of consciousness. Either say neuro, neurobiology is something more than we thought it was, or consciousness is something less, something less than we thought it was. Some people have tried to take that move. Somebody like uh, Daniel Dennett, for example, has said so much of consciousness is an illusion. My view is that if you want to try and explain consciousness wholly in terms of these objective mechanisms in the brain, you may have to deflate consciousness to some considerable so it seems extent. Still, that the jump you're taking is from our current, the sh current shortcomings of theories of consciousness to project that then all future theories have that same shortcoming. You, I think you're certain to make kind that leap of, and, and, and not. Like there's a million different theories of consciousness, and some of them are I'm totally on board with. The question is reductionist theories of consciousness in terms of neuroscience. The question is what resources does neuroscience give you? And the reduction of the explanatory base in neuroscience, the stuff we explain everything in terms of, is a bunch of mechanisms which come down to certain structures playing certain dynamical roles, which is fantastic for explaining how it is that the brain does certain things, produces certain behaviors and certain responses. But for any explanation of that kind, you can always ask the, the further question, why does all this objective functioning give you consciousness? So any theory, my view is any theory cast purely in terms of objective structure and function will leave that gap. Maybe there are other kinds of theories. Is there a deepest intuition about what would, what would resist a deflation from your point of view? Is there, you know, what, what aspect of subjectivity do you see hardest to fit in principle against the kind of models that exist or could evolve from those that exist? I would say you know, it's the fact that it feels like something mm -hmm. from the inside. I mean, yeah. there's this classic philosophical thought experiment of uh, Mary, the scientist in a black and white room, who um, knows everything about color processes in the brain and about the wavelengths that bring them about and about the, uh, the retinal and the neurophysiological responses and about the words uh, we associate with these things. Um, but she is herself colorblind. Or maybe she grew up in a black and white room. Um, so she knows all about the brain processes associated with seeing red, but she's never had the experience right. of seeing red. And it looks like, OK, she knows all the brain stuff, but she doesn't know the central thing about seeing red, namely what it's like from the inside. That's the subjective experience. So, so, so imagine a fast forward of existing measurements and theories where you have, um, take, take a fanciful example of an MRI that can map the column space of the color area in V4 or something like that. And you look and you see that people who can resolve certain collections of perceptions that include one that she doesn't have partition activity in two five dimensions or something, and yeah. she does it in four. And then you have some manipulation where she suddenly partitions it into five and tells you, aha, now I see this. Mm -hmm. So is, is an explanation like that, what's an identification of something you might measure with the idea that there's a qualia associated with it, not count as a, at least a possible explanation? Not an explanation, but um, enough of, an, enough of a, a model to kind of say, well, maybe this is enough. I agree it's a model, and I agree there's a kind of explanation you get from this kind of work of building up. It's basically building up systematic correlations right. between these things, you know, the brain processes and the experiences, such that, for example, one could make some predictions if somebody has a certain novel kind of brain process here. You know, David Hume talked about the missing shade of blue, the one he had never experienced. Well, maybe we could predict that if you had a certain neurophysiological process there in between the other shades of blue, then you'd get that experience. Well, I mean, of the missing shade of blue, and that's, that's predictive. And that is, to a certain extent, explanatory. But what it's not is a full reductive explanation of the experience. Right. Well, one example that does exist that sort of this reminds me of right away is um, the, uh, the difference between natural, naturally um, deaf signers and people who have acquired deafness in signing and the use of physical space. And I think it's Ursula Baluji or somebody who's done a lot of work on this, and they find that the um, auditory cortex takes over visual functions. And there's a fluency difference. And, and so people who are natural signers will know if somebody's truly fluent because the, of the way they use space in front of them in their hands and, and place things. And you know, there's a whole visual motor component to their, to their, their language, effectively, that's not, you know, it's, it's not auditory. And there's a neural representation that's novel. 
So, you know, I mean, that, you know, not that that's a proof that this is all in the brain or mm -hmm. that this is an argument against the philosophical standpoint, but I just, you know, there are these kinds of things like this. Mm -hmm. And they yep. give us a sense that they're, you know, the identifications get, get larger. This is what we're getting from the science of consciousness um, right. over the last 20 years. A beautiful set of isomorphisms from processes in consciousness to psychological processes, some computational processes, and some gradually developing some brain level processes. There's nothing here, I think, that answers the fundamental question. Why does all that brain stuff give you consciousness in the first place? Rather, this science takes the existence of consciousness for granted as a kind of datum. It says, given that we have it, what does it correlate with? And we're getting a, we're getting a very nice science from that. But, uh, and that's why you know, people always want to you know, put it as if by opposing the reductionist explanation of consciousness, you're opposing science completely. But no, in fact, the science has been tremendously productive been predictive and some of it's even becoming useful in, you know, in treating patients in clinical settings where we've taken stuff we know about the correlates of consciousness and put it to, to, uh, to practical uh, purposes. But it does, does leave the fundamental philosophical question open. I should say, I'm I mean, we, we, are, you know, we could focus all day on the things that make consciousness difficult, but we've got people here who are speaking in an optimistic tone of voice about the, uh, you know, the wonderful theories that might be just around the corner. So I'm curious to hear what, pe what some people think are the uh, are, uh, other places where they, where they see we're actually likely to be making progress, say, over, next, over the next 10, 20, 30 years, and what kind of theories might be the ones that will have some promise. Uh, Gabrielle, do you have a view? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a scientist. Um, I mean, I'm still sort of hung up on this sort of question of what the it is when you say we can explain all the, we can find out more and more about the brain processes and the complex dynamic systems that are implemented in the brain, but we still haven't explained consciousness. I'm just sort of interested in what we think we're trying to explain. Is it, so we're all sitting in this room and there's this background hum of the, the air coming into the room and there's this kind of disperse consciousness that maybe we're, we're aware of that. And then there's this sort of focused consciousness that brought your attention to the sound of the air coming into the room. So surely we're conscious of that because I've now brought your attention to it. But that's attentional consciousness, which is different than dispersed consciousness that might be just happening in the background. And, and, I, and I'm sort of curious, actually, to ask the scientists too, sort of when, we're, when you're sitting in the lab and you're devising an experiment about memory or what we're experiencing when we're asleep in dreaming states, um, how do you know that we're studying a conscious state unless there's someone reporting on it, saying that I'm conscious of this thing? Um, of course, once they've reported on it, then you're, then you're talking about a particular kind of consciousness, the consciousness that acquires access and attention. So what is the, the clever workaround that the scientists here are using to sort of get at that problem? Yeah, well, I, I think we don't have a workaround for understanding awareness during sleep. Aside from maybe lucid dreaming, we know very little mm -hmm. about that. And I think maybe if we get somewhere, it will be with some brain measures that have a tight correlation. But we're not there yet. Um, but back to, to the other idea of memory, I think one of the perhaps answers to your, your point is um, in a number of fields, in my field in memory research, one of the approaches is to contrast different types of memory. And so we have a widely agreed upon contrast between implicit memory and explicit memory. And mm -hmm. so we understand the brain mechanisms of these types of memory and how they differ from each other. And the interesting part of that is that with explicit memory, you can do mental time travel and you can relive a past event. You can have a conscious experience of something from the past. With implicit memory, you don't have that. Now, both types of memory are very complex. So we can look in the brain and ask, well, what's happening to allow those uh, memory, memory of phenomena to go forward? And then how do they differ? What fundamental differences are there between those two types? So that's, again, not a solution. It's not the answer. But it's one of the avenues, of which there are many, to try to pinpoint um, the essential features that are happening in the brain. And, and then my thought is, as we pursue that, we might have some new ideas about what it is that's special about the aware memories compared to the unaware memories is one example. Carl, do you have a view on where the, uh, where the progress is going to come from? Um, I think the progress will come from posing, posing the problem. I mean, you asked a very good question. You gave an excellent answer. Um, 
I wonder whether just looking at the brain as a scientist might hold the clue to the hardness of it. So you, you've been talking about inferring through correlations, through statistical regularities, mappings, that this is a conscious brain that's making its own inferences about its own sensory input. But if it is the case that the brain is a scientist um, in the game of trying to infer the causes of the sensory information, then there is, we come back to this fundamental problem. The brain is actually trying to make inferences about itself. And that's not the same you know, as, you, as you trying to infer whether this subject is conscious or not, or whether somebody is having some um, perceptual adventure in a dream during sleep, or trying to impute whether they are conscious when they're not allowed to um, verbally report. So all of these issues, I think, do uh, detract from the fundamental thing. It's my inference. And how do I infer that I'm making an inference when the machinery I'm using to do it is the thing that's making the inference? It means I have to sit on top of it. How about this? We make a deal. Old model you, new model me. <laughs> <laughs> then we'd have to merge our ego boundaries, and then we'd all be happy. Right? <laughs> Because, in fact, our modeling is, is a group. The science yeah. endeavor is a group process. It's not each of us on our own. And I think what you say about uh, changing understanding of existing uh, notions, it is very much true in my field as a physicist that uh, our understanding of matter over the last 200 years has changed enormously. So if people tell me I'm a materialist, I ask them, well, do you mean like in 1800 or 1905 or 1925? Or uh, maybe you are a string theorist. Uh, you, do you see the world in terms of strings? Or, I mean, the same word matter has evolved from something inert and something objectively uh, existing to something which you can only probe by taking a, a, a stance of how you measure it and something which, on a smaller scale, can even have completely different properties, maybe even live in a different number of dimensions. So it may very well be that uh, gradually over time our understanding of the brain-mind connection will also move on. And what, what you sometimes call panpsychism, pen uh, that everything has a conscious component. The first time we hear that, we think about the physics world and then within the physics world, some sort of spooky fluid uh, field or medium, whatever, which is then consciousness. But that would be as strange as uh, learning relativity theory and saying there is matter and there is energy, and somehow the two interpenetrate each other. It's so mysterious. Actually, there is one thing, and sometimes it condenses into matter, and sometimes it's, uh, it shows itself as energy. And it's not two different things which interpenetrate or, or interact with each other. Um, the way William James uh, said it, I really like about uh, matter and mind. He said, if two lines intersect, there is one point where they cross, not two different points. The, there is one point lying on two lines. So mind and matter, uh, I can look at this as a physical object, but this is also an experience in my mind. But the experienced uh, bottle and the physical bottle, for me, there are not two bottles which somehow have to be pushed together. It's the intersection of both. Or, or the coupling. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I use the word coupling because I'm mindful of that nice example about an understanding of DNA and how it causes us to be here as phenotypes and how good phenotypes propagate through their genes. In that, there's a circular causality which does, I think, bridge different levels of explanation. So the difference between the, the physical bottle and your inference that that is a bottle causing the sensations caused by physical bottles, mm -hmm. that's one example of closing that circular mm -hmm. causality that I, I think does bridge the levels. So I think the deflationary explanations are unsatisfactory because they deny the challenge of coupling the levels of explanations. You talk about experiences and beliefs, which basically means that neuroscience has to have a formal machinery to explain, quantify, and write down beliefs. I mean, it's as simple as that. And once you've done that, you can then work out how neuronal firing causes beliefs, and then you can work out how beliefs change neural firing. And this gets to your state example, which is a very 
it, it's not a theoretical example. It's, it's a, it, for me, it's an example that kind of uh, enlarges in, in many of the cases that we see, because almost all of them are like your, your neuroscientist in a room when they're hard. If there's no output, and you, and you start to have correlations that get you close to states that look like states that when the person doesn't have a motor problem, they can talk to you and do lots of things. But then you have this kind of limited set of measurements to try, and you might not get a response that's expected. In other words, they seem to have the right parts of the brain. They should be able to, if they were just awake and conscious and in the state that you or I were in, do a few things that you could measure and reliably get the result, and you don't. So then is it, is it their point of view? Are they in a lucid dreaming-like state? Are they in some other you know, altered consciousness because we don't have a model that says you, know, you get represent, rep representational stuff with subjectivity when all this happens in the brain, and if you're missing this aspect of it, you kind of don't, or actually it's as if you know, you're there but you're not really aware so you're not taking in the uh, sensory information and processing it the way you would be if you were kind of admitting to the world around you being real. I mean, there's just an endless number of variations on it that you could sit there and kind of wonder, well, is that what I'm looking at? I am assuming that you can, in your lab, say this person is conscious this person is comatose, and this person is dead. Well, okay. Let's start with let's start with the, the last two. So, <laughs> okay. Okay. Because no, because I think you know the, the, that's that's meaningful. So we know when someone's dead. Okay, and and that's actually and that, that that's the most unambiguous and um, not not present with uncertainty determination that we can make given all of our available tools. And so the only time that that becomes uh, an issue of uncertainty is that sometimes we're relying on a subset of those tools because it's not practical to make every possible measurement to determine that every pers dead person is dead. Okay, but it is, it is possible to unambiguously and unequivocally figure out if somebody is dead. That we understand. Coma is also a state that has not too much ambiguity. Somebody who's comatose with the right reasons to be comatose in terms of medical problems, the correlational data that go, goes along with being in a deep coma doesn't have a lot of variation, doesn't have a lot of variance. And I would actually say that we shouldn't have a problem identifying when somebody's in a coma. But that's the, that's, you know, this is, this is the left end, if we put it on a linear scale, that's the extreme left. On the extreme right would be full consciousness. And when you move from coma, the next level up would be people who appear to be comatose in terms of not responding to you in any way, but for periods of time their eyes open, their eyes close. That's, that's sort of definitionally what vegetative state is. Now, vegetative state should be defined or um, identified by a whole biological context in which the brain is very severely injured and that eye opening and eye closure is just reflecting a remnant of arousal of the brain stem and activity above the brain stem not being present. But then things get more complicated because that measurement isn't always that, that assessment isn't always followed up with measurements that would verify that underlying model, and you hear stories about people who are diagnosed as vegetative who have high-level cognition, and that, we just had a whole conference on this about six months ago. That's just a contradiction and just a mistake. I mean, those are patients who are misdiagnosed as vegetative, and there should be lots of correlational data that tell you that that's probably bad as an assumption, and we've been working that out as a field, and I think everybody's kind of getting to that point. But then the next level up is that you start to show some sign of consciousness. You may give a thumbs up. You may give some very limited response, but you can't communicate. So you can't go and say, well, what's, what's inside of this person's you know, subjective response? And, and, you know, and actually, what's their status of consciousness compared to you and me when we can tell you about it and give you metaphors and speak in sentences about it? And then, it, and then it, the grading as you go up gets you know, more complicated, and there are elements of memory or orientation or self-awareness and things like that that don't come back. And then, Finally, you get into a range of normative conscious experience, which is really pretty wide, because once you get to be near normal, then things are highly multivariate. So it, it's, it's, it's actually, it, the answer is no, I, we can't do that. <laughs> you cannot detect what changes in the brain as the person from the vegetative state moves towards the consciousness. No, that, that I didn't say. No, but that's why I'm asking. Yeah, that's different. We can, at a coarse grain fashion, do that and increasingly well, and that's the engine underneath our science. So you can draw a rough line. 
we can draw a rough line with some coarse graded uh, points on the grid and, and that's how this game is getting played and it's, and it's increasingly getting more predictive. So what do you think about that? Oh, I think it's a great, um, it's moving towards a great science of the, of the correlations between you know, what brain areas, what brain criteria there are for being conscious and for not being conscious. Although even as a science of correlations, I think it has to be said it's fairly primitive in some respects. At the moment, we've got some clear cases cases where we think, okay, there's very good reasons for thinking these people are conscious and we, we, we know the, uh, we're beginning to know something about the brain processes that go along with that. But as you move away from the clear cases, it gets very difficult. You know, there are cases where people aren't responding. And I always want to ask the question, well, how do you know there's not some residual consciousness there that's not showing up in their, uh, in their actions and their responses? instruments that detect those differences, then that would be... This would, all be this would all be so much easier if we had the famous consciousness meter. You just wave, it, wave, the, wave this instrument at Nico's head and get a readout of his consciousness up on, the, uh, up on the screen. It doesn't have to be a consciousness meter. It could be from uh, instruments that detect the activity of the brain that you say is now detectable. I, I can tell you that in practice, and this is, this is going to be reduced to an operational set of problems, and I can think of really great cases. The, the boundary question that you're posing is, what about minimally conscious versus vegetative? Where, you know, if you have somebody who has some level of brain activity or some very low level response you measure, when is it conscious versus when is it really like coma? And you know what the answer is, we don't know how to do that. And, and there's some very interesting stuff when you start trying to make sense of some of the things you might measure or observe and correlate with neuronal function, but we don't have a model that says this kind of brain activity you know, creates a representational subjective internal state. And you can you know, make a few probes at it and say, well, you know, it at least has this content. There's nothing, there's nothing like that. I have a question uh, about, about this. If, if you find somebody who can have a minimal reaction, like a yes, no, yes. then in principle you would think it can take a very long time, but in principle, you could get a sentence out of that person by asking, is it A, is it B, or whatever in the tree? Yes, no, you're, you're, right in, you're right in the game. And so we, we, have, we, have, we have examples on every edge of that, right? So uh, I, you know, we have patients who we first detect that they can follow a command to move their eye. And we have one woman we saw after two years, even her family had never seen any response. Once that was discovered, then a huge effort was made to connect with her, and she can inconsistently communicate. But she doesn't yet have any way with existing technology to turn that into a successful communication system. So we believe she's conscious. When there are windows of time when she's aware enough that she can use that eye, you know, we, we know that that state is one in which she has awareness. And some of the some of the problems of memory and things like that that she may have because she's injured medial temporal structures can kind of be you know, suggested by things she does answer right and things she doesn't answer right. And we have other examples of patients who you know, have these very narrow communication channels where you start to get a flavor for it. But then we have patients who have every correlation, in fact, examples where their brains look better than all these patients, where we have absolutely nothing. And now that, you know, I mean, there, there's like the ultimate urgency to kind of figure this out because some of these people are very young and they're otherwise healthy. Their problem is just brain injury. But yeah, you know, so we, we, we see that. And then, and then we have examples where people have transitioned. So we had one man who came to us who all but one person who saw them thought they were unconscious, but the one person who figured out they were conscious worked out a head movement system so that they could spell very slowly out and it was clear that they were conscious and then they were given various tools and they harnessed them over time. Now that patient sent us emails and we came back after five years in, with a great email saying, I'm looking forward to coming so I can show you what I can do now. And, you know, and, and over time had evolved a much more full and complete communication system so that you know, we could see through his writing, through the book he was writing, his, his interests, he wanted to go to cooking school. You know, that, that, that you know, the fullness of his consciousness was there. And actually his brain was more structurally injured than the other five people like this that we've been following. So, you know, it's, it's true, but it's not trivial. <laughs> so is it possible that you've got this case of someone who only responds via head movements or maybe by uh, blinking their eyes or, or something, and that's the only way they can express their consciousness? This raises the question, well, couldn't there be someone who 
didn't have the ability to make the head movement so and, to, like and, and to blink their eyes, but nonetheless had yeah, some kind of full patients consciousness. patients that we've studied yeah. who I worry very much about that, and, uh, and we think the data give us the probability that that's the way they are. But, but you but know, we don't have the tools to say they, that is the way they are. But you you but think they're, they're probably conscious? I, yeah, absolutely. And the question is, what do we do about it? Mm. But now that you can, uh, you can uh, uh, measure their brains, you can ask them to to use the way of thinking, to, to use the blood flow in the right. brain effectively instead of the head movement. Right. So this is where, the, this, this gets into the hard, this, the, the, the absolute core of the issue here. Measurement isn't that easy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not, it's often those measurements aren't super reliable even in normals. But once you start introducing issues of brain injury, state variations because of brain injury, so that you know, the, they may have the material there to do a mental imagery response, but their arousal function or their level of, their quality of consciousness mm -hmm. over their wakeful periods of time varies dramatically. You start getting into complexities about not having a reliable model that says, this is what has to happen, this is the state it has to be in, it has to be held constant in this way, and, you know, and this is how you're gonna get reliable communication. So the, you know, again, these are more practical issues, but they make, it, they make it then hard when you don't have the communication to make an assessment of where they are subjectively. Because again, it's, it's an assessment of what's their subjective state that needs some kind of readout for, from them to you to make an estimate of it. And your practical problem is actually twofold because you wanna know what their current state of awareness is and you wanna know what the future holds. Well also how to move them so that they can get better and yeah. become part of the world or interactive with the world. They're part of the world. But to be part of the community. Yeah. That, that's right. And so that's, that's exactly, and so that's why, you know, we, I think we're pretty close to where the predictive models tell us what we can do because we would have a consequence if they were better. So to my, what you're saying to me now, what you're saying now sounds like um, that depending on, from patient to patient even, what could be a marker for activity in the brain is different. And this actually reminds me of another thing that William James says when he talks about consciousness. He says some, something like, I'm going to misquote, um, total pluralism, absolute insularity. And of course, he's talking about how consciousness is personal. And for every person in the room, there's a different consciousness. But also, it sounds like, even scientifically, for every brain injured patient that comes in, there's a different, potentially different measure that you're going to need to, to figure out whether in these in patients the are aware. In of modern medicine, this is the ultimate in personalized medicine. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But, but that doesn't mean there won't be a general model about mm -hmm. how the brain works. Right? But if in all these different cases, you know, if, if there's, for every different possible case, there's a different mechanism that you're looking at, then in the normal case, well, but this that, is, I mean, this is that's the, a theory with a lot of disjuncts. Right, no, but I mean, this, you know, at some point, the, there, there should be some simplicities, right? Right, you know, right. Like, like there's a brain, it's got parts, and they're in the right state, and we could be clever about, you know, working around brain lesions and the rest of it. But you know, it is, it, I mean, it does come down to the biology of it. So something like coma, you know, things are very uniform in how the brain activity appears everywhere. And once you start getting minimal signs of consciousness, then things get much more complex. And they start looking a lot like normal depending on which, you know, measure you're looking at. And then it's the same problem. Like, what, what are the correlations that are meaningful? Well, consciousness seems very, like, almost like leaky or something. Like, it sort of goes, <laughs> like, it can sort of go to, like, one kind of process. And that's going to be the one that's correlated with consciousness or it can leak into some other well, area, depending on what nice parts. to have a model that said, you know, yeah, if you have yeah. a subjective state that has, you know, that, that's correlated with this belief or that I'm, you know, I'm dreaming versus I believe I'm mm -hmm. in the world, that, you know, they're both conscious, but what's the, what's the, what's the measure that's associated with it? We just don't have that. The, the pluralism here is more about the way that you access or you infer that there is some inference going on. Right. I get the impression that any modality will do, whether it's a right. pillar of response or whittling of a finger, <coughs> as long as there's some embodied expression of it, mm -hmm. exactly. which can be very different and very individual. But uh, uh, implicit in that, underneath, you think that there is something canonical about the conscious brain you need yes. to demonstrate. Coming back to your question, though, if you could never demonstrate it, would you say that that person was no longer consciousness, conscious? Well, okay, so I mean, let's, just, let's go canonical, right? So it's the stuff that the brain is made of is very stereotyped, right? So, you know, we have certain, I mean, there's complexity on complexity, but we think of consciousness as in the corticothalamic system, right? And the corticothalamic system has conservation of motifs. I mean, the cells are different. They have all, all sorts of interesting differences. But, you know, if we had a whole hemisphere 
we have these rules from clinical neurology, and it's only an issue when it's only an issue when the, the motor system is out of the game, right? Because if the motor system's in the game, and we have, you know, that, I mean, that's and there's some fine print there. If I can, I can hear, I can hear my colleagues jumping up because it, inside the motor system, in terms of will to action and other things, there might be things that that stop you from showing conscious behaviors, even though you have a connection to your skeletal muscle system. But let's just say that you know the issue is. Um, you know, is, is, is this person in a conscious brain state? Well, but there are some correlations we have. If you have one hemisphere, you can be conscious, and if you had enough thalmocortical cells and they were in the right state, you know, we kind of think that you should be conscious. And if you're not, then, then it's just because there's something we don't understand. So you're saying that, I mean, it doesn't have to be the striatal muscle system. It could be your autonomic system. Sure. I could right. show a, a, a cardiac acceleration or a yes, blush. Yes. Absolutely. Right. So the key thing is acting on the world, a part of being yes. embodied. It's somehow I have to yes. change the world in order to express my consciousness or not. And that, but that, you have to generate a bit that we can detect. Yeah, practically speaking, but are you saying, I mean, I guess it's a little bit like the question, can you be a scientist if you can never do an experiment? You can certainly have scientific aspirations, and you can certainly have glorious ideas about all the data other scientists are generating, but are you truly a scientist if for the rest of your life you can never acquire any more data? Actually, that reminds me of my profession of, as a physicist. The latest cosmology theories have not one universe, but a multiverse. Uh, multiple universes and the best theories we have predict that but we know that we cannot check it so is that empirical science no is it science well it's a consequence of empirical sciences but it's a similar gray area well, it sounds like the situation you're in then you know that's right it's actually not that different right i mean it's because there but we don't even have the theory that predicts these things we just have the observations that you know there are different states that look like they could be supporting consciousness so people are trying to come up with unified models of consciousness. One of, the, uh, one of the interesting things that's happened recently is people trying to develop systematic quantitative theories of consciousness that might have some application to these cases. Um, there's, you know, there's Giulio Tononi's integration, integrated information theory where he basically says consciousness goes, around, goes along with the amount of information that's being integrated uh, in the brain or in some other, some other process. And you know, he measures this with a quantity he calls phi. So you have a lot of phi, you've got you know, a lot of consciousness, you've got less phi, you've got, uh, you've got less consciousness. And actually, the conference we had, um, one of the more interesting presentations was someone trying to apply that to the case of people diagnosed with vegetative state and related conditions. I mean, this thing phi is actually very hard to measure in the brain, but people find surrogates for it that might at least approximate a perturbational complexity. And, and, and so one of the and things so, that evolved there yeah. was that it's very, very good at the dichotomization of not conscious and conscious. Mm -hmm. So it helps you find people who are vegetative, the proxies that do the, yeah. the Marcello Messamini's work. It's very nice to separate people who are in coma, uh, anesthetic coma or vegetative state from wakefulness. But once you start getting into these conditions of minimally conscious, confusional behavior on your way up to normative conscious behavior, it's it's it, it, there's no fine line and there's and there and there's no separation so that you know that doesn't mean there aren't other measures and there isn't a model but it's just that that's where we're lacking we're lacking something that gives us an insight into the dynamics that are really informative about qualitative subjective consciousness and like, even within these models nobody knows we get this you get this number out of it but you know yeah. five could be you know one or ten or a hundred or or a thousand nobody knows which where on this line corresponds to no consciousness. I mean, I think Tononi's own view is that even in a, if there's a right. tiny amount of information integrating, there's a tiny amount of consciousness. But that's, in a way, philosophical Right. It's not a mechanistic account of it. Yeah. So presumably, if our robots get complex enough, we can ask the robots whether they are conscious. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, would be, that, would, that would convince me. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Why is this any different than uh, before you knew that cirrhosis of the liver caused ictus? And so you saw yellow people, right. and you didn't know why they were yellow, but you knew they were yellow. Then you discovered that it was because the liver was sick. So why is, why is the manifestation of the organ so different and so difficult? To it's the number of times you said, we don't have the tools, we don't have the tools. Is it just a question of tools? Well, the tools and the theory, and they go together, I think. 
I mean, you can invent all sorts of models, which I think Tononi has one of them. There's many. Uh, but, and I'm sure in the old days, people invented various theories why someone was yellow. So there were many models. But eventually, you discovered why, in fact, they were yellow. And then you even refined that further and further and further right. to the chemical level. So why is that kind of thinking not applicable to the issue of consciousness? Well, it, it could be that it is, and we're just not clever enough to see how existing tools and models you know, could be used to kind of account for it. But I think it's qualitatively distinct. So if you had other people turning, you know, other diseases turning people other colors, and there were different substances, which there are, and I you know, can't remember the history of where uh, ictil, you know, icterus came in with, you know, all that. But the, I think the feeling is, and I think what you're hearing is that the, none of the models, none of the measurement tools, even in principle, give a satisfying flavor that they could give you an account of how there's a subjective, internally representational state occurring with neuronal activity of any pattern. One, one answer, though, I mean, you spoke about thalamocortical um, interaction. So my guess is you do actually have an understanding of the functional anatomy of consciousness. Yes. You're just being a bit modest. At the state level. Of course. <laughs> I, I think the difference between jaundice and the liver is that there is, um, it's an easy problem because the, you, know, you don't have to explain how being yellow causes liver disease. I think that there's a much deeper issue when it comes to um, this levels of description and the circular causality. So what the question is, for the brain, that might be disconnected from the world. Is there sufficient evidence of self-organization by which there is coupling between different scales, if you like, the, the scales of neural firing and the scales of belief? That might be reflected in phi, or it might not be. You know, I think that there, you, know, you don't need to apply the notion of self-organization to understand the physiology of jaundice, but you do need to understand it to find out what is quintessential about the conscious brain, even if it can't tell you it's conscious. And I'm sure that's in the sort of the hierarchy um, and in that separation of spatial and temporal scales um, that clearly you in your head believe is, is, is crucially tied to thalamocortical interactions sure. and possibly bits of the brain which you might say the, pre, the, the prefrontal cortex and I'm sure you'd have something to say about self-organization as, as something which is, you know, to crack that I think you're getting much closer to cracking the, the consciousness. It's not totally open. There is a lawful set of correlations and they're increasingly available, but yeah, I, I agree. What you said about Feynman and making something, uh, only when we uh, knew how to make a pump could we understand the heart, and only after uh, making sonar could we understand bats. So uh, we are not yet at the point that we can make an artificial brain. Our computers are so much worse the hardware and the software combined so much worse at, at dealing with everyday life than our brains are. So by the time we can make an artificially intelligent uh, robot, uh, either physically or, or in a computer program, ideally physically moving around, if that robot can really behave like a human, I think we will be much, much closer to answering the question how hard a hard problem is. And until we are close to that, uh, these questions of what is consciousness and what is not, even on the, on the level of information processing, it would be like trying to understand the heart without knowing much about pumps. My impression is David doesn't agree with that, do you? <laughs> with, um... with the robot that will become increasingly uh, self-aware. Oh, no, I think I don't see any difference in principle between robots and biological brains. I think, you know, it's very difficult to see how all this silicon inside a robot should give you consciousness, but it's equally difficult to see how a bunch of neurons inside a brain should give you consciousness, but somehow the neurons in the brain go along with consciousness. I don't see why silicon should be any worse in principle. I mean, I suspect that everything we, what we know about the, uh, the brain and thinking about cognition in general seems to suggest that what matters is the information processing and the, and the representation of the world and so on. And I don't think that's got a lot specifically to do with, uh, with neurons as opposed to, uh, to silicon. I think, for example, if you you know, you replace my neurons. My neurons start wearing out, and you replace them with prosthetic neurons made of silicon. 
you know, one at a time. And the question is, well, what's going to happen to my consciousness? Well, as long as those prosthetic neurons are doing their job right and connecting up to the other neurons, I'm at least going to keep responding the same way. And is there any reason to think my consciousness is going to fade out or suddenly disappear? I don't, I don't see why not. So I'm, I guess I'm inclined to, to agree with Pete that if we had the, the robot that was functioning as if it was conscious, it would probably be conscious. But that alone doesn't tell us, doesn't solve the hard problem. You know, I could have a complete blueprint of Pete's brain right now. Um, and that wouldn't necessarily solve the hard problem. I would say the hard problem will remain equally hard, but our chances to deal with it will, will become better. We have not only one example of biological consciousness, but if we get more than one example, then we can approach the hard problem from different angles and maybe deal with it better. But I suppose David's point about that is if we have a conscious robot, David would say perhaps we can't understand how it's conscious just by understanding how the silicon works. We'd have to invoke a primitive of consciousness to understand it. So you're speculating about our theory about any kind of consciousness, that it's silicon, even though you built it. Mm -hmm. I guess you would say, even though we built this conscious robot, we don't know how it works just by thinking about silicon. We have to invoke something else. And that's what I'm, I'm, not, I'm not willing to take that point. I don't know, I don't know how we're going to have to explain that theory later. And maybe we will be able to explain it by thinking about how the silicon works. But, but David, David already knows that that's not going to be sufficient. One thing, it is, one thing that is likely true, once we can produce these computational bases for consciousness in robots, we'll have the room to do a whole bunch of you know, experiments, mm -hmm. like come up with variations on, uh, on the computational system and take this part away and take this part away and see what matters in producing the consciousness associated responses that might actually give us a whole bunch of relevant data. I mean, I don't know about the ethics of this, producing you know, new conscious robots with you know, impaired, impaired consciousness. But so in principle, it would. Uh, it's an yeah. Isaac Asimov problem. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 it reminds me of what you said earlier about the matter state, right? Mm -hmm. Because maybe you know, at some point, exactly. there are aspects of the matter state that once you get to the descriptors that are important in the brain, mm -hmm. you know, are material to what we associate with consciousness. And then, mm -hmm. and then it becomes, you know, a problem that makes contact with things like string theory or whatever that, yeah. you know, become important to the work you do. And I guess, do you have any intuitions about that? Absolutely. Uh, the history of physics, uh, when, we, when Maxwell discovered the right equations, he posited an ether in which the equations were vibrations. And it was just a too much a leap to imagine that there are vibrations without a carrier. But now we have accepted, and the children learn it in school or as undergraduates, and we sort of say, of well, that's how it is. And nobody talks about an ether anymore. So I think the notion of panpsychism or uh, any of that, I think that it's an intermediate guidance towards a direction of where to go and what an ether-less or a pan-psychism-less theory will be, nobody can know. We have, we have to get more data. And uh, the beauty of, of uh, natural science uh, is that if you get more data, you can sharpen your theory, which tells you how to look for better data. And that sharpens your theory. It really, it's never that, that the one gives the other. It is an uh, interplay. I mean, that's my guess, too. The, in, the measurements are going to drive this, and we just don't have a lot of them right now. But I think what is important to realize here is that uh, until we study consciousness, whether it's origin of matter or of life, anything in biology or physics, you all can start with space and time and a distribution of matter. Even the origin of life, it's a rearrangement of molecules in space and time. But once you start about consciousness, then our understanding of space and time and molecules is generated in our consciousness. So suddenly, uh, we have to really question, can we do the type of reductionism in which we start with a stage of space and time, and then in that stage, we find the rules of the game. But for the first time, the stage is produced in the phenomena we want to study. So it's a little bit, again, sorry to go back to physics, but. <laughs> Uh, I know that many physicists are arrogant and they want to explain everything as physics. I try not to be that way, but I use the metaphors of my trade, like everybody tends to do. Within physics, 
Special relativity tells you what happens if you go at fast, at very high speed, and how time and space uh, change. But it's different from general relativity. General relativity tells you how matter warps and curved space, and the curved space influences matter. That is a circle. So general relativity is much more difficult on a technical level than special relativity, and also much more interesting. It can generate black holes. It can, can explain the Big Bang. Because uh, you have the gravity influence, influencing space and time, and space and time influencing gravity. And I think that is a reasonable metaphor, only as a metaphor, I'm not trying to explain anything, metaphor for the mind-world problem. You use your mind to understand the world, and in the world you have brains which somehow are connected with the mind. Take questions from the audience? Sure. Anytime. Okay. Please. You have to go to the mic. A while ago, a young guy who was minimally conscious was given something like Ambien by his mother, and he was suddenly alert after a long time, and then it's been duplicated with a few others. What's going on? So, um, actually, if, if you're interested, you can read a, you can type in uh, Zolpidem, which is the uh, trade name for Ambien, in E-Life, one word, E-L-I-F-E, -E, and the first Google hit will be a paper that we published on three patients like this. And um, yeah, we, we have an idea about what we think is going on, but in, in, in you know, very short you know, description, what's going on is that in the patients who respond, that drug is creating an activation um, in an interesting way, like uh, other drugs that are sedating, like anesthetic drugs, there's an early phase where the brain has an ex excitation before it goes down. And, it, and the drug, when, when, when you give Ambien or you, you know, other medications like it to produce this, these effects, it's in a low dose. It's what they call a subsedative dose. And it sort of creates this wave of excitation. What we think is happening is these patients are living on the edge of being able to catch a, wave, catch a ride on that wave and become active. And the measurements in the paper and the theory, and it's elaborate, um, it says why we think the cells in the thalamocortical system are poised on the edge of being able to catch that wave and then ride with it for a few hours. And, 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 and then over time, this, this allows the brain to be much more active and express behavior. And it can be very dramatic. And this is all free on the web. You can see the videos of one of the patients where the effect is, is very clear. Okay. So, so this is the fence that you're saying? Well, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an effect across the whole system of the, the brain, but we think that the primary effect is in the central thalamus and the frontal cortex, and that the rest of the system follows the changes there, but that's the theoretical part. The measurements are the measurements, and they're very uh, lawful. You can see in the paper. So this is the fancy version of coffee. It's the fancy version of coffee with a lot more bells and whistles and much more effective, at least in these contexts. Most of the time, if we you took it, we, we would go to sleep. So it's <laughs> Within the limits of what's ethical to test, um, are any of you taking an evolutionary view and looking at um, consciousness in other animals, or are you starting from the assumption that we're the only conscious animal? I don't think any of us make that assumption. Yeah. However, it is true the primary data that each of us has about consciousness comes from the first person case. It's because of my own consciousness that I believe there's consciousness at all. So the only thing I'm certain of with respect to consciousness is that I have it, maybe that humans have it. Beyond that, it's, it's got to be an extension. And the speculation, that said, I think a lot of people are making interesting models of consciousness in, in non-human animals. I don't know if that applies to anybody here. I would agree with you, what you said. I mean, ultimately, the problem we have is that if we want to know if somebody's conscious, we need some way for them to let us report it. And so, I mean, I, I, I agree with David. I mean, a lot of animals are conscious, but I can't communicate with them. And, and so the, 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 the human communication problem sets the, you know, kind of the operational criteria for us right now. 
great question. Yeah. Same issue arises. Right. Same issue arises. I think you know you have a, you have an inference of continuity. I'm trying to puzzle things out, you know, in my mind, a kind of a continuum. Um, if 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 we interject mind, so brain, mind, and consciousness, in an attempt to distill this, I'm thinking there are these experiments in which. Um, a problem is presented to the subject, and uh, in one of them, somebody just makes this, uh, there's a window shade with a thing hanging down, and they take their finger and it make it swing. And in trying to solve, it has no relationship to the problem, which is to bring two, uh, to tie something together. Um, and they solve, they come up with a solution. Um, However, when asked about the solution, they never mentioned that they saw, uh, what, it, what would you call it, you know, hanging from the shade, this, this thing coming down. They never mentioned that they observed this thing swinging and made an association uh, that brought about the solution to the problem. Uh, in my mind, that's a narrative. Um, so theoretically, it might be possible to uh, if you have the brain hooked up to find out what parts of the brain uh, are involved in this process. So we might be able to distill mind to some extent in relationship to brain through, through the measure as neuroscientists are doing. On the other hand, uh, to the extent that anybody believes in psychic research, um, there seems to be some evidence um, of, of psychic phenomenon, if you accept the, that this is a science at all, the statistics that show more than a, a random or an accidental, uh, you know, number of times that somebody comes up with something, uh, that strikes me like the multi-universe that you have a string theory uh, and you can't test for it um, at the other end of the extreme. So what I'm asking is. Uh, is this is somewhere in that an approach where you might distill consciousness separate from mind in relationship to brain in an attempt to to apprehend the name of this discussion apprehending consciousness in an attempt to apprehend consciousness as distinct from brain or distinct from mind's relationship to brain does that make any sense is that... I would say it's uh, the difference between string theory and multiverse is that string theory is probably testable, but we don't have the tools yet. So uh, either in, uh, in the future, it could be 10, 20 years, it could be 1,000 years, we will likely to find, to develop some sort of tool to uh, test string theory. And if somebody is very clever, they may suddenly realize that among the astrophysical observations, cosmic rays, neutrinos, whatever, there is already a test of string theory. In some ways, we are close, so that may happen. Multiverse, on the other hand, if you have other universes which are causally disconnected, then in principle, you cannot make connection with them. So that's a very different uh, type of ignorance. There are levels of ignorance which are, which are different. So if somebody would say uh, there may be consciousness not connected with matter, and if the theory would postulate that there is no interaction between them, then as an empirical scientist, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, it's like saying there are uh, elementary particles uh, weak, more weakly interacting than neutrinos, so weakly that there is no interaction at all. Well, yeah, there may be those particles, but they, don't, they are not part of physics because they don't make, make a difference. But I'm saying, can you, ex if with the experiments between brain and mind in neuroscience, uh, can, can one get to a point maybe similar to that, we, where we can see in some way that there's something con like consciousness, but we can't identify it, the situation that you're saying with string theory in relationship to multiverse. We're not in a place yet to identify consciousness where we're at, but we can see that it's separate from the reductionist mind-brain uh, business. You know, in other words, experiment with mind and brain in neuroscience will bring us closer to, to that correlation, but we're still left 
with some, some X. Uh, I think what you're saying, some X possibly being there that we're not yet close enough to have a system for, but we can be more certain that there's a distinction now between brain and mind, and it, uh, we have an alternative to a reductionist uh, being left simply with that. I mean, my view is there's something missing in our, in our theories that need to be added, for example, to the ontology of physics to give you an explanation of, uh, of consciousness. And the question is whether that's just adding, you said x, so the question is whether x just equals consciousness, whether that's the extra thing you need to add. A Pete in a paper 20 years ago said, well, maybe it could be something else. It needn't be consciousness. For example, I think your, his analogy was explaining motion in terms of space. Well, you can't quite do it. You've got to add something, but do you add motion or do you add time? Well, you add time to space and you get motion. Maybe there's something else, X. We add that to physics, we get consciousness. Who's to say? That's an open possibility, too. Well, I could also add to the, to the beginning part of your question another neuroscience approach to think of when we're dealing with intuitive problem solving is in your example is that we can, we can make intuitive decisions. This is something we study in neuroscience, and the intuitive decisions we think about as being driven by implicit learning. So in other words, they're decisions made with information we don't know we have. And so there's nothing, we don't need to postulate some extra process there. We understand that sometimes we make strategic decisions and sometimes we come up with an answer, some insight that's coming out of our implicit knowledge, information we've acquired. And so we can understand how those two types of memory interact. And this, so this is another approach that is, is not, not open to saying there's something missing. We're sort of, we think we have a story there about how these decisions are, are being made. Yeah, I'm not jumping to a metaphysic, but I'm asking, for example, the intuitive, can you find it in, in the mind yes. brain by well, neuroscience? We can find implicit learning in the brain, yes. Carl, did you want to respond to that? Uh, well, yeah, the couple of things you mentioned, and also to the previous question about sort of um, how far up the evolutionary scale would you go before you, you, you thought consciousness of the sort we're talking about emerges. Uh, in, in my little world, the X is inference. Um, so in my simple world, consciousness means inference. And talking about narratives, talking about strategy, immediately tells you that you have the equipment to make inferences about counterfactuals, about things that not, have not yet occurred. The discussion we're having about hierarchies immediately tells me that the, sort of the model I have of the world is a hierarchical model. And that immediately puts certain formal constraints on, or differences, distinctions between animates or organisms that have deep hierarchical models and shallow hierarchical models. So a virus, from my point of view, does do inference and has a very primitive form of consciousness. But by virtue of the fact it doesn't have a deep hierarchical model, it doesn't have the depth, it doesn't have the self-reflection, it, it can never represent its representations. I think what you're talking about when you talk about narratives and strategy, again, coming back to the brain as a scientist, the ability to plan an experiment and choose amongst different experiments or different ways of sampling the world is um, somewhat unique to higher organisms. And I think that, that, that in terms of building self-organized robots that show conscious-like behavior, it is that um, prospective, both a deep hierarchical model with the ability to free oneself from time. So you now have a representation of the world, not just now, but in the future. And I think those, that's a... So, so is that almost like a, an add-on in your mind, like a, a world three object as Popper and Eccles would have put it, you know, the, the inference and hierarchical, deep hierarchical model in addition to the basic laws of physics? Or is it? I would actually, the basic laws of physics are actually a reflection of that deep inference. Okay, so, so I, so I have been going it's further prior, than you. Uh, <laughs> even better. My idealists over here. Yeah, Mine comes first, then the world. Yeah. I actually have a question for you, quickly, before we move on. So we, you've, you've mentioned implicit memories and tacit problem solving. Um, do you think that there's something it's like to be an organism that can only perform implicit problem solving? And, have implicit memories. So you're, you're asking me the zombie question, then, are you? I mean, sort of, although, I mean, I'm, I'm just curious what your answer is. So are these, are these, is this like a different kind of consciousness you're talking about, or, or is there, are the lights, I mean, yeah, this is a zombie question, but yeah, are the lights on or off when someone is 
Yeah, well, I think we, we have to be a little tentative the same way we are with the coma patients. So when someone demonstrates some knowledge that they're not aware of, you're asking, well, are they a little bit aware of it, or is there nothing? And so, our, is that, so it, it seems that there's nothing that it's like to, oh. actually, you can ask the same question of perception, right? So mm -hmm. if I show you something subliminally, and your behavior betrays that that information was processed, mm -hmm. do you have some awareness of that? And I would say, well, no. <laughs> That's how we're defining it. That's how we're understanding it, that you, you, were, you were influenced by the subliminal information, but not aware of it. So is that is that your question? I mean, I, I, mean, I think most of our I think I my maybe it's just me, but I think most of my life goes on sort of in that sort of implicit, tacit way of mode of being. Um, and so, the question of consciousness for me becomes the question of when the system is trying to access itself. That's right. So we would, I think, most neuroscientists would say that. Most of what the brain is doing, we're not aware of. Right. But even if I speak one sentence, when I begin to weave the sentence, I don't know yet how it end ends. So each sentence is a mystery and an adventure. <laughs> e.m. E force. <laughs> uh, this translational stuff, it sounds like, you know, when people are talking in different languages, and I'm not sure that I'm, I'm getting what everybody is saying, and maybe I'm just being redundant with my question. But uh, I, I, I've been trying to think of this, uh, you know, consciousness seems to be graded, you know, and so that when we have, uh, you know, most of the time we're running on a, ha a habitual mode, and then if we're doing some kind of pattern matching and that pattern uh, that we're ex being exposed to doesn't fit what were our, our expectations, and, you know, the, in order to make safe predictions about the future, then suddenly we up the... Up the, the ante in terms of the uh, amount of brain that we are uh, synchronizing. It seems like uh, uh, that reward system, stuff like that, is actually part of some kind of switch that actually uh, enhances the access or the uh, of the prefrontal cortex to to amplify uh, a more granular uh, approach to pattern matching that allows for more elementary particles to start to be recomposed into a, a, a pattern that may be more fresh de nouveau. And it is that in that, uh, and this, this discussion of consciousness uh, you know, is, is about this synchronization process and, and accessing uh, 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 a broader uh, network that includes uh, more self-awareness so that we can get some sense of who we are in relationship to this this thing that we're you know which doesn't fit our expectations, and so we're doing that pattern optimization thing, and then that leads to utilizing a, a, a different pattern to to drive our behavior. Does that make sense? Um, I, I think it does. Um, it strikes me, again, a notion of hierarchy quite gracefully accommodates all these issues. So Helmholtz's unconscious influence was right at the level of the visual cortex, and you're not aware of that, and yet, as you say, we go around using our vision all the time. You talk about patterns. Um, patterns, by definition, are relationships amongst elements, therefore you're naturally invoking hierarchy. You're talking about speech that has a, a, a temporal extent that an instant doesn't have. Again, you're invoking a temporal hierarchy, a separation of temporal scales. I think nearly everything that everybody has said in some way speaks to the notion of modeling upon modeling upon modeling in a, in a hierarchical sense to give you a deep hierarchy. Um, for free, well, not for free, but almost inevitably, um, again, this comes back to what we understand by the physics of self-organization, the deeper the more global, the more phi-esque um, you get in the hierarchy, uh, the greater the temporal extent of, your, of the things that are brought together or subsumed under the patterns. So a sentence or a narrative, by definition, is deep, deep, deep in the hierarchy that sees all the stuff on the surface and in the deep past and possibly in the deep future. <laughs> 
And I th so I think that you can relax a lot of the, um, the distinction between aware and unaware, or aware of being aware, or aware of being aware of being aware, and so on, uh, for, within a hierarchical, within a hierarchical sort of perspective. It's very expensive. So I, I think that we try to conserve our energies, and we continually use this habitual system, and then only when uh, our predictions are not going to be met, by, because there's not a good fit with the, uh, the current expectation, the current pattern that's being used. That's when we access this, the prefrontal cortex and then do this more granular thing and may, may even make a new assignment in terms of uh, a new attractor net you know, with a higher node that sta instantiates a, a novel pattern that responds to this, this current uh, situation that we're in that didn't meet you know, with previous patterns. Uh, I am new into philosophy, so right now I'm very confused individual, um, and I have a question, but it's more related to panpsychism. I was reading that it is the view that is consciousness, that everything has consciousness. So a person can show you that it's conscious, blinking their eyes, a dog can show you consciousness, rolling around, but how a chair can show me consciousness. I, I don't understand that. Well, one of the issues with consciousness is it's very hard to know decisively whether any other system is conscious. The, other, the flip side of that is very hard to know decisively that any other system is unconscious. The one really good case, as Nico mentioned, is with people because you know, they can at least tell us what they're, uh, what they're conscious of. And you can even raise questions about that. Um, but most of us are happy to go along with that uh, verbal report when it's present. But when it's not present, then we no longer have that materials for, those materials for inference. So monkeys and uh, dogs and uh, mice. Well, some people are prepared to say there's enough analogs of what's present in, uh, in humans to ascribe consciousness. But as that disappears, then we're left, in, we're left more in the dark. But that doesn't mean that what, so you might say, oh, well, in those cases, we should say it's not conscious once you get down to a bacteria or a virus or a, a quark. But I think you know, that would be, you might say that's an overreaction. Um, we do not, there's an absence of evidence for consciousness, but there's not, there's not evidence of the absence of consciousness. We've got to separate uh, those two things. And you might say, well, going in, we should just say we're agnostic. So what's so the question? There's two possibilities. You know, the quark is conscious or it's not. Now, you might say on antecedent grounds, it's awfully unlikely that a quark should be conscious, and fair enough, that's an intuition. But uh, you know, there are also philosophical systems that want to say that some, at least some precursor of consciousness is present at this uh, bottom level of, of reality. And there are even scientific theories like Chinoni's that tend to at least give some motivation for ascribing consciousness to simple systems. So I think the basic answer is there's no, there's no direct evidence of consciousness in systems that are a long way from the paradigmatic human cases. At best, we've got to work with, um, but, there's, but there's likewise no direct evidence of unconsciousness. So we're left in this difficult philosophical situations of having to make indirect inferences, which are, may always remain somewhat speculative. Uh, okay, so I might just be like a presumptuous undergrad student right here, but so I have like, uh, I'm affected all the time by people's consciousnesses all around the world um, in this social consciousness um, because I have this social media and kind of connection to people past in this room or past in my direct uh, world. And so I'm kind of wondering, is there that social consciousness? Um, is that different than what we've ever seen before? Uh, because we have so much more connection than any time before. Um, and then kind of past that, we've talked a lot about consciousness in time and space. Um, and if we do have that social consciousness, is it outside of any sort of time and space than we've ever worked in before? Especially because we can travel across time zones so easily. Um, and then past that, with our mental time travel, we can go into predicted future and then also absolute archived past. Um, and so we know through that. Um, and so I'm kind of wondering, 
how is that affecting like the immediate research and what we're thinking about versus our social consciousness. Hey, tonight we're all going to time travel one hour into the future. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, but does that mean that like we don't, we don't uh, kind of think about our new social consciousness that I've kind of termed all of a sudden um, in a system of time and space that we've ever thought about it before? Is that true or am I just kind of going too far out there? Pass the ball. <laughs> it's funny because being a physicist, I claim I own space and time, and you are all visiting me in space and time. <laughs> but seriously, uh, it's an extremely interesting question. I mean, I'm a multicellular organism, as you are, and none of your cells, as far as we know, are conscious, but you have this different consciousness. So now we have this internet with billions of people being connected. Is there a kind of consciousness which we are not aware of? It's an extremely interesting question, and I don't have any answer. Does anybody? <laughs> this is a good question. Thank so, you. Yeah? So um, I noticed that there aren't any historians on this panel. Um, <laughs> Um, yes. Um, <laughs> Used to be. <laughs> so, um, and, um, and, and so I'll, I won't infer any insult to my field. Um, I wonder if you think there's anything that the history of the neurosciences or maybe the history of ideas can offer to this conversation sure. um, at all. Yeah, I'll take that. I used to be. I did a history and philosophy of science degree a long time ago. And so I think, I think it does. I think um, there's, there's a lot of very interesting uh, <laughs> rich information and, and in, in my field, in the subfield of thinking about thalmocortical mechanisms underlying consciousness, uh, you know, there's a lot that I learned from going back to work that was done in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and, and, in, and into the 70s. I mean, there, some, some of the work that was done there is very contemporary, and it's just sort of been lost because of interesting historical shifts and how things were funded through study sections and through grant applications and um, you know, there's, there's, there's quite a lot. And whenever you get, you get into fields like physiology, where the experiments are hard and there's a lot of detail in them, uh, there's always something to learn if you go back and, and read good experimental work where all the details were taken down. So, um, I mean, I could fill that in with lots of examples, but I think the answer is yes. There are points in history where people were actually much more sophisticated about consciousness in some respects than, yeah. than we are. I mean. Even the history of uh, the history of psychophysics, um, the history of psychology in the mid 19th century was really conceived of as the study of right. of consciousness, and that was their primary data. In many respects, it was uh, there were certain kinds of sophistication that have since been been lost in philosophy. Well, there's the phenomenological tradition, say from the early 20th century. I've been recently trying to, you know, talking a lot to people who do who study Buddhist mm -hmm. philosophy, where there's a tradition of you know really meditating on consciousness. Right from the inside. I think even if you don't take on board all the metaphysical or theoretical uh, conclusions that went along with these worldviews, we have a lot to learn by studying their, their methods for, for you know, gathering the data totally. of consciousness from a subjective perspective. And I think there is a parallel in both physics and chemistry. Uh, physics started with the uh, observation of the motion of the planets. And the data from the motion of the planets came from the Babylonians. And the Babylonians saw the planets as gods moving around and having a good time or a bad time fighting each other. Uh, but then the Greeks took the data from the Babylonians and stripped off the, the mythological, they had their own mythology, but the Babylonian mythology, and they made a mathematical framework. And that's ultimately helped uh, us to, to get science off the ground. That is in physics. And in chemistry, the alchemy, uh, most of the alchemy books were absolutely full of allegorical connections with this and that and the other thing. And then chemistry came from the distillation of the, the factual knowledge inside of all of that. So it would have been very difficult to start physics without the Babylonians. It would have been very difficult to start chemistry without using the alchemic database. And similarly, I think if you don't use the Buddhist database at the very least, and I don't say that with, uh, in disrespect, I say that in complete respect for all the, all the observations that have been made and all the inferences, it would be a shame if you, we, we wouldn't use that. And it would be very different from the 
physics and chemistry, history. That makes a lot of sense. Hi. Hello. Hi. Uh, firstly, thank you so much for your contributions today. Today was excellent. Um, my question is about beliefs. So I was wondering if there are any new findings or exciting research on how our beliefs, when reinforced, held firmer versus held more loosely, how, you know, what the relationship that, with that is with uh, the flow, the speed, the very nature of consciousness. Perhaps I, I can address that from the point of view of Bayesian beliefs. So there's, um, in the past decades, only two decades, there's, there's a, a theme in neuroscience use, um, loosely summarized as the Bayesian brain. Um, comes along in different guises like predictive processing or predictive coding. So the idea is that the brain is a, a statistical organ that's generating explanations for its sensory inputs uh, according to um, Bayesian principles. Um, and in that sense, that, that, that Bayesian framework does actually give you a formalism in which you can write down and quantify beliefs, Bayesian beliefs that are probability distributions. Um, and those ideas can be traced back to Helmholtz and unconscious inference and right back to the, in fact, the students of Plato just giving a historical twist into, into the answer. So the, much of what I was saying in terms of inference and consciousness presupposes that the understanding of the brain's function can be described at the level of beliefs. And what I meant by beliefs was simply probability distributions over fictive constructs that explain the data that I am sampling from the world. But there might be beliefs that are not as well formed as... So we say the word belief, and we have the belief that it's Saturday and that we're sitting in this room, but presumably there's lots of other kinds of beliefs that would fit this model that don't have that strict, kind of formal, articulate, transferable structure. Just thinking about the beliefs, the proto-beliefs that an infant might have or an animal. Um, tacit beliefs that sort of work to sort of form and structure our behavior, but that we never entertain consciously, but they still have some, they might still have shared this kind of Bayesian structure. Um, so there's, there's also the question that the philosopher always asks is like, what do you mean by belief? And then there's these different kinds and they might all fit into, into the sort of topic of consciousness, but they all might also play different roles. Thank you. Um, I wanted to contribute something to um, the different states of consciousness um, as a self-report and have you respond to it. At 14, I had a concussion playing football. I was aware of events immediately after the concussion and then out of awareness for an extended period of time, then back in awareness. <clears throat> About eight years ago, I had an experience of transient amnesia, which is fairly common to football players as they age. During the period of transient amnesia, I talked to the EMS squad out of taking me to the hospital have no memory of it. I was driven to Long Island Jewish Hospital. I recognized the road to the hospital. I was then out of awareness for about 18 hours. I came to arguing with a psychiatrist that they weren't doing anything for me, at which point I was fully aware and quite angry at the hospital that nobody was paying attention to me, which apparently I was aware of, though I wasn't aware of. Yes. So during this period, I experienced, and I'd like to have you react to it, different states of awareness that were both physical and implied a great deal about memory because when I came back to myself, as I say it, 
I was aware of who I was. In the other states, though I was reactive to the environment and reactive to other people, I wasn't aware of who I am, which implies a different state of consciousness involving some self-awareness and memory or identity, which I didn't hear expressed here at all, that we have in consciousness a sense of identity. Right, well this is, you know, mm -hmm. I'm sure we both have comments on this because you know, I've, and I've, I've, I've been on the other side of your experience interacting with people having transient right. global amnesia now, I took in the emergency it in, room. And I took it one more step, which I'd like to give you. I've had a brain scan. I've had an EEG scan. I had a brain scan for medical reasons, not associated with the original concussion. I follow the stuff on the NFL and high school football injuries very closely. When I had the amnesia, I contacted the people doing the NFL studies when I found out that ball players after 65 have these transient amnesia states. But I also had an EEG recently, which in fact might have showed me the area that was originally damaged in the concussion and the compensations, if it is to be believed. But the question I have is about identity being part of consciousness. Yeah. I'll, I'll start, because I think you'll have more to say about this maybe. The, um, yeah, I've been on the other side of this, talking to people, you know, so you know, I obviously wasn't there talking to you, but with a global amnesia, you, it's if you, you, you may not know a lot of things. There, there may be aspects of your autobiographical memory. Certainly where, where you are and why you are there goes away, but you can be very conscious. So it is a question of what you can access in memory and what you remember about what happened. And I think that, you know, there are all these different memory systems and perhaps uh, a more elaborate answer will, will follow. But I, I, I suspect that it's just another example of how you can take components out of the integrated experience of normative consciousness and remove them, but still have very much a conscious mental state. And that's why it's highly multivariate when you start looking at just what normal consciousness provides you with in terms of awareness. Because if you're trained to observe certain things, you're aware of th some things that other people aren't trained to listen to music or look at a picture or just kind of pick up on nuances of facial expressions aren't aware of. So, you know, that's a, that's a sort of a small, small, small uh, version of the larger theme that if you start losing parts of your memory or types of your memory, things are very weird. And if you, and, you, know, if you go under anesthesia and you're given an amnestic, you'll talk to the surgeons and you'll be fine. You won't remember any of that you know, discourse or any of that period, but you, know, it's not, you haven't actually lost a component of your memory. You just had something that set, set you up to wipe out the memory trace for later. So there, there are a lot of games you can play. You know? Yeah, so you're right. The, so the fact that you remember nothing after that anesthesia doesn't mean you weren't fully aware exactly. at that moment. And so I think it's, it's interesting, the other point you made about these separate components. So of course our own awareness a really important part is our self-consciousness and our con uh, complex concepts that that brings in. But you could put that aside, and we could take language and put that aside, and still have a quite rich subjective experience to try to understand. And so these are these are in a sense optional parts. There may be very interesting parts to examine <laughs> and important parts, but we can also study consciousness with those aside and try to understand them. So there are many studies of amnesia some with chronic amnesia where you can, you can see that people can't lay down memories of their experiences, but they seem to be quite with it in the moment. So it's possible to be fully conscious and not lay down memories. So that, that doesn't mean your consciousness was, was completely distorted, but different in some very interesting ways. And, and your, your observation, I think, is extremely interesting. I was listening very carefully to kind of what, you know, you, you, you experience the continuity of your assessment of the, um, the, 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 the neglect in the ER, which is, you know, a very common theme. I'm sure everybody's experienced that in the modern day. And then, you know, so that's, that's, the, um, that's the clue that y y there was something that, you know, was kind of 
gradually making its way back and had continuity between the two states for you. And that's, that's also interesting. Yeah, and maybe it's because it has a limbic valence. Who knows? And this is that, that I heard, heard the discussion of consciousness out without the concept of identity. Uh, that there is, is there, is there a sense of oneself in consciousness or is it there were periods of time in which I was reactive to the environment? I argued to not be taken to the hospital, though I should have been taken to the hospital. Uh, but I have no awareness of it. When, would the concept of self or identity be implicit in this? somewheres in the idea of consciousness. People often distinguish consciousness, this primary consciousness, consciousness of the world, from self-consciousness. Uh, I would think of self-consciousness as one variety of consciousness, an especially important variety, but certainly not as exhausting all of consciousness. And it might even be on this view that, for example, a dog or a mouse might have primary consciousness without it consciousness of, its, uh, of itself. And one take on what was happening in your situation is that there was consciousness of the world without a whole lot of, of self-consciousness, of consciousness of your identity. I'm not sure that's the right, right diagnosis. It could be that you had some consciousness of yourself and you weren't laying down memories. That's but, a, but there are good examples of this. So there are yeah. developmental stages where self-consciousness becomes more you know, evident and easy to measure. And then in, in other types of brain injury, there are slower, more slowly evolving recoveries of self-awareness as a stage of recovery. So that you, know, you, you can dissociate these things. And, and there are people who have studied this very precisely. To talk about too, there's the sort of self that seems connected to experience, even if it's a very kind of loose sense of identity, just in an instant, or a kind of self identity that persists over time, for which you know we experience it as relatively continuous. But when you have an injury right. or you black out, then you sort of there's a discontinuous personal identity over time. Right. So then there are philosophers who do think that that any experience of consciousness sort of has to have at its center of gravity a self. And then there are others who don't. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to bring up uh, an aspect of consciousness that seems pretty important to me, but I don't think anyone's really raised this, but the, the moral implications of consciousness. Um, I mean, I think all of us think that it's probably wrong to hurt other human beings, but it's probably not wrong maybe to pull the plug on someone who's already like in a maybe comatose, comatose state or something. But then, and then so many people believe because animals have some level of consciousness, it's, it's wrong to torture them or harm them. But then if, if we think like that maybe consciousness has something to do with the integration of information, then uh, should we worry about things like unplugging the internet or if somebody develops an artificial intelligence, if, if we're not sure if it's conscious, should we you know, give, give things the benefit of the doubt? Or what, what's your attitude about that? That's a good question. If you start becoming sympathetic to panpsychism, that there's, there's some consciousness everywhere, then you really have to worry. <laughs> you know, I mean, some people think they shouldn't eat anything, which is conscious. But uh, well, maybe we're going to have to draw the line somewhere else if, uh, if consciousness is very extensive. I mean, that kind of. No, there is this intuition that consciousness is what matters morally, but as you start thinking about degrees of consciousness getting lower and, uh, and lower um, in simpler and simpler systems, you can also start to think that what matters might be the kind of, of consciousness. Maybe there are kinds of consciousness that matter more than others. You know, suffering, for example, might carry a, a special moral weight, or maybe beings with the capacity for conscious thought and reflection, that carries a lot more weight than beings with simply the capacity to sense hot and cold. I do agree with you that consciousness is the ultimate ground, I think, of our moral concern for, for other beings. So that's got to be somehow where it starts. But you know, exactly what kinds of consciousness matter? And, and with respect to human consciousness, that's, that's how most, most of the law and most of the moral intuitions have evolved around well, so the, you know, the, in, on, on the uh, medical ethics side, the negative right to withhold medical treatment or have me medical with treatment withheld 
was founded on the lack of a potential for recovery of cognition and consciousness. And I think you know, what's, what's evolving now is, of course, as we understand the recovery of consciousness and the variations in potential, then you know, there's a lot of questions about how we, how we start to look at the opportunities there are for people to become more conscious and the moral obligations to them to become more conscious. My colleague, Joseph Finns, has a book coming out uh, in, in July called Rights Come to Mind, which is an, a full exploration of these issues lived through the experience of people taking care of patients with disorders of consciousness. And, and, and you know, most of these issues are, are unsolved in our system from a legal and a medical point of view. So it's, it's you know, I think you're right to, to pinpoint consciousness as the, uh, as David said, just the, the core, you know, issue around moral warrants and, you know, getting, getting into this space. Thank you, great conversation this afternoon. Um, wondering um, if whether you think it's accurate to grade consciousness from an external perspective when consciousness is such an internal experience, i.e. the quality of experience. This, whether you're a human animal, non-human animal, or an individual who experiences a cognitive disability. Question, has research been able to determine a consistent experience, exp experience of consciousness between those with and without cognitive dysfunction? And if so, what does this imply in terms of the ability to provide a universally accepted <clears throat> And definition of consciousness, except in the most general sense. Of course, we could use neurons, for example, to explain consciousness, but only in the most rudimentary sense of what consciousness is. I, I would say research has not provided a clear and distinct set of measurements to categorize things that way, from my point of view. may not be capable of making a good decision. And so there are right. legal precedents for how to deal with those situations right. and informed consent and so forth. Right. That's so we, we, right. we have some operational ways to proceed. That, that's sort of behavior and, and, and you know, sort of uh, speech acts. I, I was thinking in terms of measurement. Mm -hmm. right. right. And that's actually what I'm, I'm, that's I thought you were saying. I'm thinking in terms of measurement, too, or an outside evaluation of what. And it has to do, I think, a lot of questions um, circulate around the issues of experiencing a disability and how we rate an individual and who does not experience this life in the same way we think they should experience that life and from our own perspective. And even the idea of, of, of dogs and, and babies and you know this kind of hierarchy that we are kind of creating a definition of consciousness and what's of great value and, and perhaps what is a lesser Human experience that we would put in the in the in the um, in the realm of just the human experience. There are some really interesting studies of consciousness in uh, schizophrenic patients compared to in uh, in normal patients using a beeper methodology. They get people to carry around uh, carry around beepers that go off at a certain point during the day, and then at that point, patients are asked to write down in their logbook what were you conscious of at that moment when the beeper went off. And you know, it's, it's extremely interesting even for, uh, even for normal patients, but uh, Russ Holbert, who's pioneered this method, has done it with schizophrenic patients as well and has found you know, certain really clear systematic differences between the consciousness in, uh, in these patients and in um, ordinary unimpaired subjects. This is, in a way, it's a, it's a methodology to take something external, you know, the beeper and the records in a logbook, but nonetheless use it as a guide to what's going on internally. Thank you. Um, my understanding is um, we have sensory perceptions, all right? We have eyes, we, we can see things to varying degrees, and we have hearing, which we use to communicate. And, and that, I think, does affect our consciousness. So the question is then is, what about someone like, say, Helen Keller, who was born both deaf and blind? Okay, so what, has, you know, what could we say about her? 
awareness or her experience, her consciousness of the world since she has lacked these two different perceptions That's a great or these example. two sensory perceptions. That's a great example. It's, it, and actually, it's one that got my interest a long time ago. The best way to find out is to read her perceptions of it. And so there's a, a fabulous uh, account of her early years before uh, Anne Macy, uh, Macy Sullivan was her teacher, came to work with her and to establish her ability to communicate and, and to start to learn. And she describes herself. She actually doesn't, it's very interesting, she doesn't even describe herself with her own name. She calls herself Phantom. And her memories of being precognitive, are, she describes them as being, in, being reactive to an external world that just, uh, just she had experiences with. And most of them were limbic. And she just thra she just, her memory is thrashing out at things coming into her peripersonal space, effectively. And um, there's, it's a small section in the book Teacher that she wrote where she talks about this. But you, know, a, a, there's, you get the sense there's something primitive, you know, awareness. But it was very unstructured. It wasn't, it wasn't structured by language. It wasn't structured by concept. And it, was, uh, and it wasn't very much fun, for sure. Um, but then you get the sense that by the time that she's an adult, and you know, she's giving lectures at Harvard, and she's a you know, fully educated woman, she, you know, she has a you know she has a very full normal human consciousness with a very unique perspective you know everybody has an identity but you know, it's it's not as alien as a as a conscious state as what she describes herself as before she had some way of connecting with the human community it's very interesting but i think that's the place to go look is what she had to say about herself Thank you for this discussion. Uh, you, one sees how many complex aspects they are to consciousness. And I'm going to speak now as an artist, uh, where the um, idea of consciousness is, since at least the middle of the 20th century, very complicated, because a whole series of uh, determinology came about, automatic writing. Uh, you ask an artist, uh, what, what did you mean when you did this? And they said, I don't know. I was unconscious. and. Uh, one realizes now that that word no longer is valid even for an artist to say they were unconscious because there are so many layers, as we can see as we're speaking, about what consciousness is. So if an artist says, I don't know what I was doing, we know that they were very conscious on many different planes and levels. And so I'm sort of interested in the idea of people speaking about conscious and unconscious and automatic writing or things that are, uh, how do you see the connective points that way? Do you see it now as one, uh, one uniform um, level of consciousness with many, many facets and planes? My brother is an artist, and he considers his painting to be a very intuitive style, so he has a lot of expertise in the media he uses, but he goes after a process that happens on the canvas, and it's, he considers it very intuitive, so I, I consider that part of, you know, part of implicit memory and part of his, his, part of his mental capacity is to do that without designing it. As, as an explicit painting that he, he is conceiving it. It's a process that unfolds. So does that connect with what you're saying? Well, there's another word, intuitive. Uh, do we have to redefine intuitive? I mean, in other words, I think there are redefinitions that become necessary because they once were put into categories. And I see it as a more fluid aspect, you know, without, without all these divisions uh, that characterize what's rational, what's irrational, uh, what's a spontaneous. That's, that's well, you know, we, we have all these divisions because that's how we try to understand things in science, and we divide them up, and then we try to understand how they fit together and how they interact. So, yes, it's very fluid, but we, we take some steps to divide them up because that's how we're going to understand the parts and then put them back together. Uh, so a very selfish question. Um, what are the easy problems of consciousness? <laughs> or to be more concrete, I guess, what are you telling your graduate students to do? <laughs> <laughs>
Well, back in the, back in the original uh, article I wrote on the hard and the easy problems of consciousness 20 odd years ago, the easy problems of consciousness were basically ones about behavior and functioning. So how uh, does the brain perceptually respond to certain stimuli? Um, how, for example, can we uh, be made to control our behavior in a way that depends on what's out there? How does the brain monitor its own processes and issue verbal reports? Basically, the easy problems on this definition, the ones all about objective functioning, the kind that can easily be measured from the outside, whereas the hard problem is about how does all that stuff give you subjective experience. And for the most part, I take it when the neuroscientists are giving their graduate student problems, they're very often at least about those, um, those easy problems, explaining the responses and the behaviors and so on. Another class of easy problems, though, is finding, of quote, easy problems, because none of these are really easy, is the correlation issue, finding the, brain, finding the brain process that goes along with certain kinds of subjective experience. And that's something which is also being proven to be a subject where you can make tractable, incremental progress in the lab year over year. Um, you know, but then there's a whole hierarchy of tractable, more and less tractable problems. So maybe other people can throw in there. You never give any hard problem to a student? In philosophy, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Only hard problems in philosophy. <laughs> That's the way to think of that. So philosophers can do the hard problem, and the scientists yeah. will chip away at it by working on the easy problems. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Very short question. I mean, uh, uh, a lot of you have been talking about the fact that when we are conscious, we have a feeling inside, that we have an experience inside. And then we use other metaphor to be a, a consciousness, like to be in an inner world, or to be intrinsic or whatever. So my question is, inside what? Because if we say that conscious experience is inside the mind, it's kind of a circular uh, definition, because it's just the thing. So it cannot be literally inside the head. We, we do not expect to find consciousness like we find sugar in the blood. So I, I just wanted to, to ask, inside what? Well, something, something, we haven't really, something we haven't really talked at all about, which I guess we'll wait till the last minute to throw it out there, is that consciousness is, as far as we know, embodied. Um, when I stub my toe, I feel pain in my toe, not in my brain, and I don't feel it in the rock that I stubbed my toe against. There seems to be this deep interface of consciousness that blends into the body um, even though we've been talking about it being situated in the brain. And so when you ask the question, we've been talking about consciousness being inside what? The first thing I think of is it's inside the body. Um, and that gets us out of that immediate circularity. And then you can say, well, what is the consciousness, the embodied consciousness inside of? And then that's a different question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just a follow up. When I feel that pain in my, in, my, in my toe, it's in my body. But when I see the sun, is consciousness embodied in the sun too, for the same reason? <laughs> when, when, I'm, when I'm driving my car on the road, I don't think I'm feeling that consciousness in the, in in the, the car and the, feeling the wheels I of the road the wheel, directly, yeah. isn't, mm -hmm. like the person with the cane. Isn't. Mm -hmm. So the body, doesn't, the body is at least something which is very flexible here. Yeah. The boundary is very flexible. Mm -hmm. If you have the right relation to the tool, then you feel the person with the cane feels the, the strike of the ground, not yeah. in their hand, but in the, in the tip of the tool. I totally feel a lot of my consciousness in the cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> Tac your tacit memory. Hi. Um, we we briefly had a we briefly had a conversation about the morality of consciousness, um, and I'm a I'm a moral <clears throat> I'm a moral nihilist, and um, I was wondering. Well, so and that is that um, uh, you don't inherently uh, um, believe that there are any there are any reasons to make moral judgments on anything. Um, and so I was wondering, um, if we're trying to make, or if we're trying to contrive these moral judgments about consciousness, um, are we just choosing to ignore um, that it's a very real possibility that we live in a amoral reality? Well, that sounds like a philosophy question. <laughs> well, if we, who's, to, who's to know where morality comes from? Maybe there's no absolute fundamental morality in the universe. If you go that way, then you can say, at the very least, what we have is something like moral preferences. There are some outcomes that we prefer 
to other ones on reflection and moral respects. Maybe there's no deep, absolute grounding for that as if it came from a god. Maybe all there is is what we've been evolutionarily programmed with. But we can still make the, make the distinction between, uh, between the outcomes that we want, that we think are better morally for society and for other people on reflection. And the, I mean, it's going to turn into a question about our fundamental values, which may be contingent and, and biological, but we can still make these uh, distinctions. And it could well be that, well, here's the thing which is what we contingently value, consciousness. That's the thing which you know, makes our lives worth living. And you know, we all have a great preference for being conscious and that you know, we care about the consciousness of other people around us. So I'd like to think that even a moral nihilist in some ways could recast some of these questions in terms of uh, you know, what we value and what we prefer. Thank you. I'm a clinical neurologist. Uh, one time I was interested in brain evolution, uh, and I learned that there were four basic stages of vertebrate uh, uh, brain evolution. Uh, the most primitive is the fish brain, then the reptile brain, and the uh, paleo and neo mammalian brains. Uh, and uh, in my clinical neurology experience, I also have had the experience of uh, patients presenting with acute stroke syndromes, which are rare, but that affect the midbrain reticular formation, which is part of the fish brain. And if uh, a part of the brain that controls a certain function in humans exists in other animals and causes uh, alterations of consciousness, uh, would it uh, be reasonable to assume that a fish is conscious if it shares that, that uh, structure? Yes. <laughs> I think. It turns out there are some, structure, some structures that fish share with us and some that they don't. I actually read a debate in the journal Fish and Fisheries about whether fish <laughs> feel pain. And one, people's, one person one was saying, yes, fish feel pain because they have this element of pain processing. And the other one was saying, no, they don't because they don't have this element of pain processing. So it just pushes the question back, which is the thing in the brain that matters? Uh, well, another point, you know, the, about uh, you know, meditation uh, experience of people who have mastered uh, meditation, um, uh, you know, teach uh, methods of really turning off the more recent uh, brain uh, structures and getting into a state which is really uh, like focusing on breathing and getting into your your brain stem, I guess. Uh, uh. It's, it's it's not so clear though. If you look at the, if you look at the data. It's actually uh, you know, very interesting. The states that experienced meditators get into are high energy states. The dynamics are different, but you know, they, you know, they, 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 they resemble more wakeful uh, brain activity than they res resemble comatose brain activity. I mean, they, you know, it's, it's so, you know, I, I don't think we, again, it's another one of these examples where we don't have a great idea about how to go from what is a conscious brain state that's a little different than your wakeful state and, and its dynamics to where, where consciousness is and that and what the, what the changes in the representational aspects of it are because we don't have a model of it. Thank you. Thank you.